Hello, everyone. Welcome to Board Journey 360 Masterclass Series. I'm Joanna Gonzalez, Global Senior Marketing Director with Boyden, and I'm based in Toronto. This is the second of our four events. It is great to be here with you today. Uh, today, we'll be zeroing in on board targeting approach and standing out. To the, and standing out, we are recording today's session. So, what we share today will also be available to you and IWF Toronto chapter members very soon. There is a breakout component today that will not be recorded. Please note, you do have the opportunity to ask questions uh, in the question in the Q and A tool feature, which we will closely monitor. Now, this series is truly a collaborative process between IWF Toronto and Boyden. Our two organizations share a deep commitment to DEI. Boyden has formed global and national DEI partnerships focused on action-oriented approach to accelerating diversity in leadership. As you can see, we regularly uh, deliver programming on, on this and related leadership subject matter because we believe this is a very critical component of the solution. And it's one we have a responsibility towards. We have a dedicated CEO and board services practice and proudly share that 45% of our board placements across Canada are women. Our global board is comprised 63% of women and we have the first female CEO of a global executive search firm. Now with that, I welcome today's session instructors, Morgan Campbell and Renee Young. For two decades, Morgan Campbell has managed executive and board searches in a range of industries, including oil and gas, energy and utilities, finance, professional services, technology, and manufacturing. He brings particular expertise to oil and gas placements and has been recognized as one of Oil Week's rising star for his ability to find the right leadership. Renee Young has rapidly built a track record of success in complex, high-profile search assignments for board and senior executive roles, as well as uh, contributing to strategy development, as well as candidate sourcing and recruitment. As a trusted advisor, she draws insights from board industry background, which includes Special, specialized experience in the not-for-profit technology and finance sectors. Renee has served on non-profit board, boards as both director and board chair and regularly works with Crown Corporations in developing skills matrices, governance, and recruitment of new directors. Over to you, Morgan and Renee. Thanks, Joanna. Thanks, Joanna. Appreciate it. I, I, was, uh, I was just laughing to myself. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. So thank you very much for the opportunity um, to represent Boyden and, and to talk a little bit about standing out and board positioning. Um, I, I do want to mention that uh, my colleagues were just making fun of me a little bit. I've taken some notes old school here. And so I will be looking or jotting down uh, my eyes here from now and then to uh, ensure that I'm I'm on point and I'm providing as much information as I can. So um, yeah, as the slides lay out here, we're gonna try to be pretty uh, interactive and not just read a bunch of slides to you and give some anecdotes. And so both Renee and I are gonna take some session, uh, some sections of this, but we're both gonna try to interact with each other here a little bit as well. Uh, there's four key objectives that we've identified here. Um, and. Um, Joanna, can you take off? This meeting will be recorded. I'm not sure if it's on everybody's screen. It's still sitting on mine. Thank you. I, I think it's okay to move ahead. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, so number one, uh, explore targeting strategies and how to become more visible and aware of board opportunities. Number two, learn how to refine your board resume to accurately reflect your unique value proposition capabilities and accomplishments. Number three, examine how to assess board opportunities. And number four, learn how to prepare for board interviews. Now, all of these things are gonna cross pollinate somewhat, but we'll try to um, take you through uh, each of these different learning objectives over the next uh, hour or so. Next slide, please. So how to become more visible and aware on board opportunities. To increase your chances of becoming a board member, uh, different, uh, we, we could slice this up a, a number of different ways, but we've identified three key areas um, that, that we believe every board member should ask themselves whether becoming, where, whether being a new board member or a seasoned board member when, uh, when exploring or evaluating these opportunities. So number one, what do I need to do to be seen? Make every interaction count. Showcase an expertise. 
publish and become a thought leader, have a global perspective and leverage your contacts. Just to speak a little bit about that. Um, the first thing that you know, I'd like to just talk about with respect to make every interaction count, uh, quality over quantity would be kind of rule number one. Now, if you can get quality and, and quantity together, even better, but you really wanna make sure that those interactions are um, as excellent, um, succinct, um, and uh, fruitful for both parties as you can. Find the right places to be seen with influencers. And influencers, you know, at the end of the day, ultimately are existing board members. Now, there might be a lot of influencers around that group, but if you're not uh, in uh, networking sectors or working within the context of finding influencers that can get you on a board, you're not in the right sort of places. So you look at different uh, influencers in terms of uh, sitting board members, recruiters like ourselves, uh, associations like the one that, we, uh, that you're currently part of, different sorts of avenues to build these networks. And they all, again, cross pollinate together. As an example, uh, I've, uh, I've had a day where I've seen a potential board member at an ICD breakfast, uh, later at the Calgary Petroleum Club, interacting with other executives, which again, you know, um, builds that sense of seniority or belonging. And at the end of the day, at a women get on board uh, sort of setting. So the more sort of avenues that you can be seen, see and be seen, be around influencers, the better chance you have of identifying board opportunities because sometimes that's half the battle of actually finding out what's out there uh, and getting your name with out there. Uh, these do need to be with influencers in a way that is not seen to be pushy and is not seen to be needy. So there's a gentle balance of being seen, being known, but also not being seen and known so much that it looks as if you're trying too hard. And there, there is a balance and a bit of an art to doing that. Um, showcasing your expertise is very important. Defining who you are up front, knowing what your story is, knowing how to tell your story. Uh, global perspectives we highlight. Uh, I, I see this in Calgary where I'm stationed today. Um, the hollowing out of the, um, of the oil and gas sector has created a bit of a vacuum here where global experience is very highly valued. And if you can demonstrate that either through your corporate career or through boards that you may sit on, uh, it, it's a very valuable asset. You need to be, even if you don't have those skills, trying to demonstrate uh, how you can or you have the ability to demonstrate those skills. And then lastly, leveraging your contacts. That might sound, um, might sound self-explanatory, but again, there's an art to doing that. Um, there's a story, and I won't name the uh, executive's name, but it, it was actually fairly famous in Calgary. There was uh, uh, a CEO of one of our largest large cap um, oil and gas companies, and his wife wanted to do board work. And um, so versus um, a um, discreet approach, he took a very overt approach and basically uh, sent an email out to a couple hundred contacts saying, you know, this is who I am and, and uh, Mrs., um, Mrs. CEO um, should be on your board. And it, it came across very poorly. It was not tactfully done. And so you want to make sure that as you leverage your contacts, you leverage them in the proper way, in the right way that represents you and your brand effectively. So how do I sell myself? Um, you're going to be hearing a lot about this over the course of this entire discussion. We highlight a couple areas here. Understand your board attributes or value. Know the score. So that means demonstrating understanding of important bit issues, understanding the history, uh, industry, uh, having a broader world perspective on the overall business climate, and connecting with people, which I just talked about a little bit. Um, over the course of the discussion, we're going to talk about how do you prepare your CV or your bio, how you prepare for the interview process. So that's all going to encompass how do I sell myself. Um, one thing I, I would mention, you do need to be in the game to be part of the game, with some exceptions. What I mean by that is if you're not putting your name out there as a potential board member, uh, you're not really in the game. 
Now, there are some exceptions of uh, ex-CEO that uh, retires and has board uh, roles that are just, you know, coming at them left, right, and center. Uh, he or she may uh, not have to go and actively uh, solicit board opportunities. They may come to them. For the vast majority of the rest of us, this is, this is something that you do have to work at. You have to be thoughtful. You have to create it as a different sort of uh, career exploration. And as a result of that, um, you know, beyond the, some of these master networkers and master board and um, uh, master individuals that really understand how to network, that is a skill, just like uh, many skills that you develop. The rest of us really have to develop a plan and think thoughtfully about what, what I want to do to sell myself and how I sell myself. Next slide, please. So we will run a quick poll right now. So we'll get that started uh, in just a moment. Everyone could just reply, where do you feel you are in your board career journey today? We will share results momentarily. This is more of a self-reflection exercise. Still see some activity, so we'll give it some time. A few more seconds. About five more seconds and we'll end the poll. Okay, we'll share the results here. So thank you everyone for contributing. It's good to see where we are, where we are at. And the tip at the bottom, be self-aware, conscious of where you are in your board journey. And we do use the, uh, the word journey um, thoughtfully. Um, again, for the vast majority of individuals, um, these things don't happen overnight. Um, I always recommend to individuals that are younger in their career um, that starting early, uh, whether that's through non-for-profits non or smaller board um, uh, organizations, be, be they uh, public sector, you know, potentially smaller private sector sort of corporate boards, are avenues to continue to build your board journey, uh, your career experience with respect to governance, uh, and these all lead up to uh, the, you know, the, the golden um, large cap sort of boards for many people. Um, that doesn't happen overnight. These are things that happen over a period of time. Here are a few resources that we've identified uh, in terms of um, looking for board opportunities. These, this, is, this is not an exhaustive uh, list by any means. Uh, it's, it's primarily Canadian focused here, but these are different avenues, both from a uh, crown corporation, uh, be it uh, federal or provincial, as well as a number of entities that are focused on uh, women on board. You've seen a few of those there, um, but, but these are also open to um, a variety of uh, male or other diversity candidates, depending on uh, the, the specific organization that you're looking at. Uh, but again, not exhaustive, but uh, if you are looking for vacancies that are uh, posted, as we all know, uh, many board positions, but particularly on the corporate side, are not posted or are um, utilized through a recruitment firm like Boyden. Uh, but these are avenues that you'd certainly see many of the ones that do go public. Uh, on this tab, we've got um, some different sort of board training and certificate, uh, certifications that you can look at. Again, not exhaustive. Uh, we've got some of the, most of these are Canadian, save for Harvard, Harvard, uh, ICD, uh, most of the individuals on this call um, will be aware of. But there's a no number of other uh, director education, both from a uh, certification or at least from a coursework and, and keeping up to date perspective that um, we've identified here and you'll have access to um, through these slides. So to close on that section, assessing board opportunities, we'd like you to consider who in your current network can you reach out to? Who do you want to add to your network? 
And what research do you need to do? Targeting organizations, targeting network organizations, and targeting events. Um, events, not just meeting, um, you know, an ICD breakfast, but a variety of events that uh, put you in the places that uh, you have the most interest in with respect to board work. So if it's in technology, may, maybe you're uh, attending innovation hub um, activities, but think outside of ones that are specifically focused around board, but also think about the industry that you're targeting and events that would have uh, influencers within that sort of context beyond um, strictly thinking about it from the respect of, I need to get on a board. Renee, over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Morgan. Are we pausing there for any questions, Joanna? Uh, yes, uh, we, we did just receive one question about ESG certifications. I'm not sure if that was listed. And if it's not, if we don't have that as a resource, we can add that before it's shared. Excellent. Perfect. Well, thanks, uh, Morgan. Uh, I feel like we've divided this, that Morgan's really taken us through uh, interacting in person. And the next section is focused on really presenting yourself in a, a static or virtual environment on paper, um, which uh, is perhaps a little bit of our, my experiences uh, coming to this with working on primarily not-for-profit, uh, Crown Corporation and uh, public sector boards. So uh, I'll bring uh, some of the experience that we've had from that perspective and encourage Morgan to jump in uh, on some of the experience he has on working with other private sector startups up in other boards uh, that Boyden specializes in. Um, when we're looking at opportunities in presenting our board uh, CVs for consideration, once we've assessed and found those opportunities, some of the things we need to look at are knowing what boards want. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, we would have been really focused on those who had experience on the, uh, in the boards or the organizations that they're looking to join. So if it was a nuclear organization, having that senior expertise, and then we would have been looking at maybe financial, legal, and even maybe as recently as seven or eight years ago, getting uh, HR at the senior leadership table and at the board table. But that's changed significantly over the last number of years and continues to evolve. And we're looking at a lot of different board experiences to be brought to the table. And that's specific uh, industry experience, leadership experience, strategic development, financial acumen, uh, digital transformation or information technology, government or regulatory, uh, depending on the organization's need to work with some of those entities, as well as corporate governance experience to help guide the board through their journey. Uh, so we have to look at what those boards are looking for, uh, understand those skills that are needed for different organizations when you're preparing your CV for the board or preparing your CV to apply. Uh, when you're preparing your bio, uh, there's a number of different ways to go about it. Uh, I don't know that there's one right way or wrong way, but certainly I would encourage that if you're doing a one pager or a simplified board um, resume or long form, some of the things you need to keep in mind uh, are that we need to include certain information to make sure that you're standing out as a candidate. Uh, information that should be included is an introductory intro, uh, what those skills are and what you'll be bringing to the table your expertise. Uh, you don't need to go into significant depth or, or as much detail as you might in, in applying for a senior role, but you certainly would want to uh, highlight your expertise through your corporate um, experience. Your qualifications uh, that might be valuable to the board, that could include things like your a CFA uh, or any uh, different um, uh, qualifications that you've had or, or uh, development or learning. Uh, board experience. Uh, when looking at applying to boards, often boards will be looking for those that are able to contribute or have board experience already. Uh, so including your board experience, which is also committees you might have sat on uh, or chaired throughout your board experience will be important to note um, on your bio when you're uh, preparing it. Language location, uh, that's probably more so on some of the crowns or corporate boards, and Morgan can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, looking at diversity, which we'll talk about in a, in a moment, um, those are often factors. Uh, if we're looking at uh, uh, crown corporation boards, they need national representation. So making sure that those uh, points are really clear on your CV are really important so that when they're assessing it and you may not have an opportunity to present yourself in person, it's important that those key facts are, are readily available and clear. Uh, for the individual that's looking at your CV. Um, it's a very competitive market. In the past, we might not have had as many individuals or postings that have gone up for many of these organizations, but now it's a more competitive market as boards are really looking to bring on expertise. And so you really need to be clear uh, of what it is that you're going to be, uh, what's setting you apart and what you'd be contributing to that board. 
I always like to group that part into things you can control. So that's really highlighting what you're bringing to the board, your expertise, uh, how you present yourself, and those are all things that you're able to really prepare. The next section that we'll move to is, is some of the things that you can't control necessarily. And that's what a board is looking for at this point. Um, it may be an organization, you've done your work and you're really interested in, in the organization and feel you have a lot to contribute, but there's a lot of factors that boards are looking at uh, when they're considering board directors. That could be their skills matrix. So those are the areas that that board has identified that they need on the team. Uh, that can be some of the traditional ones that we've discussed as well as some of the new ones. Uh, but it, it's important that they have a cross section of experience on the board. So we can't have uh, you know six financial individuals and then not have other experiences on the board to offset and make sure that they've got a well-rounded expertise on the board to help guide the organization and the senior leadership. Diversity. Uh, diversity is very broad. That can include regional diversity across the country, uh, gender, ethnicity, uh, language. All of those are important uh, in ensuring that they've got a, a good representation uh, to help guide the organization. Terms of other board directors as well. Uh, if you've got some board directors that are coming off with certain expertise, they may be particularly focused on that round of recruitment to ensure that they're bringing individuals on the board that too can complement the board and, and not have a gap in their skills matrix. So those are the sums that some of the things that we aren't able to control in terms of what the board's looking for at that period of time. Uh, and it may mean that you're a, a really good contributor to that board, but the timing might be off. So it's important to just stay in touch with those organizations and still still keep on mind that uh, it might just be timing um, for um, for uh, your application at that time. Closing the gap, or maybe I'll pause there, Morgan. Is there anything else you'd highlight that you'd like to see when you have a CV coming in and, and you're considering boards? Uh, the, the only other comment that I'd make, and uh, this may or may not be the right place to, to bring it up, but uh, I'll, I'll insert it here, Renee, um, nonetheless. Uh, there, Renee had, had made the comment um, a little earlier that their competition uh, has never been so fierce for uh, board seats as it is today. Um, now, that's, that's the case both corporately and from a public sector perspective. Uh, in the public sector, uh, there, there is a more ample opportunity for individuals to apply. Uh, that's both from a, a federal and from a provincial perspective. And, you know, as an example, uh, I think Brene would, would uh, agree with me on, on some of these larger crown roles like the Royal Mint or the Canadian Energy Regulator. We're seeing three to 500 applicants on, on a number of these searches. So the, the competition and, and frankly how it's vetted due to the size of that competition uh, looks very differently, particularly if a search firm isn't actually hired to support them. I just referenced two that we've supported, but if they're doing it on their own, you can expect that the vet is uh, very, very high level. And so uh, the resume really needs to be able to pull out, which we're going to talk about the resume in a second, that experience. Conversely, on, on the corporate side, while no less competitive, it continues to be hard to identify where those oper opportunities are, particularly on the mid-cap and large-cap organizations. And there is a, a dichotomy of, in one sense, organizations like ISS and Glass-Lewis uh, beyond uh, I, you know, I think being the right thing to do, um, there, there's pressure on these organizations um, to diversify, uh, not just in terms of uh, things like uh, uh, gender or uh, geography or age, but there is also pressure for them to look at different skill sets. At, at the same time, um, we all still know that there's an old, old boys club that exists on many boards, certainly Calgary. Uh, and Alberta have the worst percentage of, uh, uh, of diversity uh, of any province at this point, although we're, we're slowly changing that. And there is still a bit of, um, I, be, I am a CEO, only CEOs understand the, the difficulty in our jobs, and I had to become a CEO to be on a board, so why shouldn't you? And so there, th th this is evolving over time, uh, but I did want to throw that in there as uh, because we do talk about a differentiation in skill sets um, that may have not existed in the past uh, for individuals that are looking at boards. But there is still uh, certainly a bias uh, on many boards to individuals if they aren't uh, a CEO, uh, they're in the C-suite. 
So I just wanted to, I'm not sure if that was the appropriate place to put it in there, but it felt like it. So I wanted to throw that in, Renee. Excellent. No, I think it's uh, it's valuable. And all of those are, are when you're looking at a board posting, it'll often highlight the skill sets that they're looking for uh, in those applications or posting that you'll see out there. And if it's represented by an organization like Boyden, we'll have a more in-depth document that you can often ask for uh, called the executive brief, which will give you additional information on the skill set sought for that board. So it's important to reflect and really assess whether or not you've got the skills to meet uh, the requirements of that board at that time when looking at uh, opportunities. So Joanna's just posted it here, uh, knowing what you're passionate about and your motivation for board service when you're assessing boards and in preparing your application, I think is really important. Um, once you've prepared your CV and you have all of that information and your bi board bio pulled together, um, you'll be looking at uh, when you're sending that out, there's closing the gap on some of the other skills. Um, so there's the things you can't control and the things you can, and then, uh, then there's closing the gap between both. And Joanna's just highlighted here uh, some of the board talent trends. Uh, Boyden hosted a global survey, uh, talent-led transformation in a post-pandemic world. And so we saw some of the stats coming out of that, that 52% of boards now require a different matrix of skills uh, to guide future organizational direction and growth. And so that's certainly, I would say, what we're seeing in our experience as well in working with organizations and, and developing their skills matrix that's changing uh, every, uh, every, every time they're looking at a board recruitment, uh, which might not have been the case in the past. From a sector perspective, uh, private equity, which Morgan will have a lot more experience on, are the biggest outlier with 66% seeing the need for a different skills matrix and industrials are following that with 55%. From a private sector, uh, public sector experience, I'm seeing the same uh, boards. They're really reflecting on the skills that they're needing. Those are shifting and they're uh, taking the time in advance of a recruitment to look at the skills that the board's going to need, not just currently, but also in the longer term and reflecting that in the terms of their board directors and how long they're appointed to the positions. Closing the gap between uh, you've put in your board, uh, you're putting your board CV and you've got the experience and you think you can add a lot of value. There's a number of things that you can do to, to really stand out. Uh, some of those include doing your due diligence, uh, really understanding the organizations that you're looking to join. Uh, there's a lot of resources online, reading the corporate summaries, uh, annual reports, following them in the media. These are all really important to demonstrate your understanding of the organization so that if you are invited forward to an interview, which we're going to go through a little bit later in today's session, uh, you're really well versed and, and uh, able to answer some of the questions that will be presented to you. So doing your homework. Understanding the time commitment. Uh, seasoned board directors will often be looking to see what uh, the board schedule looks like to check their commitment levels. Uh, if you apply to a lot of boards and then don't have the time commitment, that can do you more harm than good in the long run, as you really need to. Boards are increasingly looking at their board directors and putting on the time commitment and effort uh, with those organizations. Uh, there's a time, I think, in the past that it was a bit of a figurehead position, but board directors are re increasingly relied on from a risk perspective as well. Uh, and so making sure that you have the time to commit to those organizations that you're applying to is important. Um, a demonstrated understanding, and, and I'll, uh, I will go back to Morgan on this one. Uh, in the past, being a CEO was uh, and having sector expertise was enough to be on a board, but having a demonstrated understanding of strategic versus operational is increasingly important. Uh, because you've led an organization, you understand the operations, doesn't necessarily ensure that you're a good board director or that you're going to be able to contribute at that level. And so organizations are going to be looking for demonstrated understanding of that, uh, of where the board responsibilities lie and where management responsibilities lie. If you're already a seasoned board director and sitting on some boards, uh, some of the things you can consider is a commitment to board turnover. Uh, we're seeing now more and more that boards are setting terms for the board directors and they're no longer staying on for an extended periods of time. They'll either time out from the end of their terms, uh, which may or may not be renewable, uh, or they'll age out. And so I think we're going to increasingly see a trend in that direction uh, where we'll see boards uh, bring on those expertise they need to lead through uh, the evolution of the organization. And they'll also be needing to bring on new talent as well as they move forward. A commitment to learning and development. I don't think that that can be underestimated in terms of ensuring that you're staying current uh, from a governance perspective and being able to contribute to those boards. We've listed a lot of resources. There's a lot out there uh, that is important and I think can be highlighted on your CV to demonstrate that you've got a continued learning uh, in your experience in contributing as a board director and are staying current. Anything um, that you'd like to add there, Morgan, uh, from your perspective that you're seeing uh, that I've missed out on? No, thank you, Renee. Okay, um, so that I see is some of the components of closing the gap. 
Uh, so you've, you've, you've really looked at your skills, you've had a, a tough look of, of where you think you'd be able to contribute, you've looked at those organizations, uh, you've prepared yourself on paper so that those that are reviewing your application or reviewing your background uh, can really see easily um, how you will be able to contribute to that board and, and how that might fit into the board skills matrix. And then closing the gap on what makes you stand out uh, in some of the experience that you can bring to the table that you've also gone over and above to be able to really add value to the organization. I think it's important, and particularly in today's day and age, uh, we're working in a really virtual environment, uh, and we may have often done face-to-face -face interviews earlier on, and now we're seeing that many organizations, including some crown corporations and private sector boards, are doing these interviews uh, in a virtual environment. So the importance of presenting yourself on paper and, and having it be very clear, uh, I think will serve individuals well in the future in, in considering board positions, as, it's, it, as we highlighted, is very competitive. Uh, I think we're going to touch on this in a little bit, but ensuring that the alignment of the values and belief and interests, uh, that's really important, I think, in looking at those boards that you want to join and where you add value. Uh, those are also going to be the ones that you'll understand the environment the best and, and really be able to communicate and, and be able to contribute to those boards. So really reviewing those and doing your due diligence before applying is important. That concludes that session uh, for that. I think we had a small, uh, do, we, do we have a poll in that one, Joanna, or is that, do we have that a little bit later? So I'll, I'll put the poll up. Uh, this is again, a self-reflection poll. So just a really quick, yes, no, unsure to, do you feel you have a good sense of what your board add value and capabilities are? Still see votes coming in. So we'll give this a few more seconds. Okay, fantastic. We'll end poll, share results. Looks like we have a very self-aware group, which is great to see. Yeah, so my advice is really making sure that that's highlighted. Um, where you've got an organization such as ours and there's a, an individual you can speak to, it's it's good to, to reach out, get as much information as you can when preparing your CV uh, and, and being really clear on where you're adding the value uh, will make uh, the selection process uh, clearer and, and probably more positive for you. So that'll complete this section and uh, we'll head over to our next one. We do have one question before we move on. Uh, what is the average time per month to commit to serve on a board? Uh, that's a good question. And I've read a couple of different stats and I'll, I'll turn this over to Morgan uh, after he may have a different experience. But typically we would look at anywhere between uh, two days a month uh, or two days 12 days a year uh, when a board is meeting uh, on average four board meetings a year. Those board meetings will usually combine the committee meetings as well and then any planning meetings over in advance. So I usually look at about 12 days of effort uh, in an annual basis and that wouldn't include any preparation or phone calls in between those uh, board meetings. So Morgan, I don't know if you have a, a, a better answer in terms of your experience. No, I, I, I... The only comment I'd make is almost every board is underrepresenting the amount of uh, um, yeah. time and work that both both from a uh, crown almost. Uh, I, I, Renee, you you um, tell me if you agree. I'm not sure if I've placed anybody on a crown or a um, or a provincial board or a federal board that has not felt it's been more work than they expected joining it. And so there needs to be some, uh, and, and part of that is the nature of, of the work um, uh, on, from a corporate perspective, uh, because the, um, just the, the rapid change in things like technology, obviously COVID has had a huge impact on businesses uh, the, in the industries that I work, particularly around oil and gas, uh, board work has uh, included things like strategic uh, reviews, it's included looking at uh, potential mergers, acquisitions. And so the, the, yes, there's a typical board schedule that in a perfect year, you may be looking at uh, 12 meetings. The reality is that boards have become, although we talk about the line between governance and operations, there's been quite a blur based on the, um, how fast uh, the world, whether it's economic or other impacts are facing businesses, that they've been much more engaged. So it's a good question. It's one that you should have a real conversation with any board that you're exploring. And the added, and I, I was going to talk about this in the next section, but the added complication is 
overboarding and or still being employed and ensuring that you have, if you feel stretched to even take on uh, the board opportunity and, and there's no flex in terms of either your employer understanding that that's part of your development and or your own work-life balance, you've put yourself in a precarious position if something should happen that, uh, that entails greater board involvement. Yeah, that's a really good example. And I know for one board uh, in particular that I've worked with more recently, uh, that board ended up meeting on an, uh, a monthly basis as a result of COVID to help guide the organization. So uh, you really have to ensure that you've got the time commitment to dedicate to the organization. So I think that's uh, to you, Morgan, to keep on yeah, discussing so them. Thank you. How to assess board opportunities. And again, these are all bleeding into each other a little bit, but I think that that's the point. Uh, we, both Renee are going to take a shot at providing some examples of, um, of things that you should look at, and I'm going to give an example or two. So we've listed here what type of board is it governing. We didn't put operating, but operating would be uh, an, another thing that you should think about. And again, I, I view that there's a bit of a bleeding between those two in certain organizations today. Fundraising, advisory, um, you should look at length of term of current board chair, of members, do they have terms? That was a good point Renee made. Many uh, board, particularly, you know, organizations that, uh, you know, in, in Calgary as an example, we've got many sort of entrepreneurial or founder uh, based organizations that haven't had term limits. And so they've had board members that have been on the board for 20 plus years and they're all in their 70s or their 80s. So what does that look like? Are they evolving? Is that something you want to be a part of? Current board composition. What specific skill sets are the board seeking in new members? And then doing your repu reputational and potential challenges and really being honest uh, with yourself. So we, we highlight, you know, reading recent equity analyst reports on the companies and its competitors, listening to those. Uh, but it, it certainly involves getting it going a few steps further in my view. You know, you should be talking to your contacts and networks. You should be uh, doing a deep dive into their financials. You should understand the broader industry. So I want to provide an example of somebody that we placed on a board and something that can be, um, you know, at the time wasn't a consideration, but it does highlight how important this is. So, um, you know, far too many people, in my view, are so anxious to get on their first board, particularly corporate boards, that they either don't do their own proper due diligence or they do and they do self-talk uh, to themselves through the flags that they've identified. And it's natural, it is tough to get that first board. So I understand that and, um, and I understand the rationale and, and, and how people's minds get there. On crown boards, as, as I'd mentioned, often people see that as their entry or, or their stepping stone to look at corporate boards but they miss, uh, but again, they don't look at the alignment in terms of the work and are they passionate about it because they're looking already one step beyond where they should be, which is the board opportunity that they're exploring. So you need to think of particularly if you have some opportunities and you have some options, time is your friend, research is your friend, um, and the mix is your friend. Maybe you want to do one community-based board, maybe you want to do one crown board and one uh, public company. If you're looking at public companies, you know, three is kind of the max these days, but it's still, you know, it's still awfully busy and you need to, again, prepare yourself for if these other, other situations, can you make the commitment to be a good board member to salt, to support that? So it's a really important sort of anecdote and, and, and it was top of mind for me because, you know, we recently had coffee and we're talking about this and you know, the last year or two, you know, she felt like she was in full time, you know, in full time work between these different organizations that um, in one board, she had 27 board meetings uh, over a period of three months. So if you think about how intense that is, uh, that's, you know, that's a unique situation, but it, it's still a reality for somebody that's sitting on a large corporate board. Uh, Renee, uh, I'll stop talking there and turn it over to you for the next slide. 
No, I'll, I'll just stay on that one just for one quick moment, Joanna, uh, to highlight the current board composition. And that can really give you a lot of information when you're considering opportunities. And, and just as an example, if we were looking at a board for uh, Export Development Canada, and you're a female uh, financial leader who's led a, a financial organization as a CEO, have board experience, and you're based in, in Ottawa, you might have the exact skill sets that would align with that board. But when you look at the board composition, if you see three other individuals individuals that already bring that skill set to the board. And um, that's going to tell you whether or not if those individuals are coming off and those terms are coming up, but we'll also identify uh, and tell you whether or not that's the skill set they're actually looking for. So you may have very, very strong skill sets to join the board, but again, it highlights some of the timing that needs to be considered. And sometimes putting in your application still is important. Uh, you shouldn't rule yourself out based on that because sometimes it does uh, get you onto the radar, particularly on some of the larger public um, sector boards uh, so that you are on the radar and can be considered potentially for other opportunities. But looking at that board composition can often tell you what some of the skills are that they might be missing. Do you want me to take this, uh, Morgan? So this is just uh, sure. some of the other opportunities uh, in reviewing board opportunities. So reviewing bylaws, uh, board director role uh, descriptions and other documents are really important. Conflict of interest is one that I think Morgan's raised as well. Uh, looking at those board opportunities, ensuring that you're not on boards that might be in conflict or in competition. Um, doing your due diligence about inquiring board, board interview, onboarding. Uh, some organizations are, are, are very sophisticated in their onboarding. Others, uh, if you see a large turnover, as we highlighted earlier, earlier board directors, uh, you might be prepared for a little bit less preparedness or a little bit less uh, sophistication around some of the onboarding that they have. And so it can require a significant amount of effort on a board director's part to get up to speed uh, on some of those uh, initiatives within those organizations. Um, understanding what your role and responsibilities and the liability will be. Most organizations will be able to provide that to you as part of the package uh, and is important for you to take into account uh, when looking at board opportunities. Um, asking for the board minutes, we've included that here. I think it would be rare, uh, Morgan, you can correct me, but often those aren't available unless it is a public sector organization. And, and in some instances, they may be available publicly. Certainly on some non-for-profits or sport associations, we may be able to see those more openly where they have a membership-based organization uh, and those board minutes are more publicly available. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the level of commitment, hours, frequency. It's a tough one to answer, but certainly uh, expect more than less uh, of what's been posted and what's been communicated, uh, the conflict of interest and compensation. I'll say that uh, I work a lot in the non-for-profit public sector and Crown Corporation, and those all share a few things, and that is that tend to uh, attract individuals uh, who are passionate about the work of the organization, not necessarily for its lucrative nature. Uh, so really ensuring again, that you've got the time and capacity to dedicate to those organizations is important. Before we move on, we do have a question that is compensation related. If there is a sense of average pay to serve on Crown, Crown Corp boards, provincial boards and private sector boards. I, I can answer that if you like. Um, so, so the, this, uh, the short answer is there's a huge amount of uh, differentiation between uh, each of these different organizations. From a provincial uh, perspective, and I'll use uh, Alberta as, as a province, 90% uh, of the provincial uh, crown boards would be in, in the order of uh, a, a retainer of 10,000 uh, and um, time, you know, about a, up to $1,000 a day for for a committee work. Um, the largest uh, boards in Alberta from a Crown perspective are in the 80 to $100,000 level. Um, and there's very few of them and one happens to be a bank. From a federal perspective, Renee, I, I think that that's even probably a little bit rich. Uh, but again, you're, you're looking in the neighborhood of you know, larger boards, perhaps a retainer up to 50,000, but that is, that's even on the, the larger uh, larger organizations. And again, there you, you, know, you get paid for, you know, uh, in kind of up to $1,000 a day for, for uh, time spent. Corporately is where there's the biggest differentiation. So, you know, as an example, a, a small cap organization may have a very small retainer and you're, you are paid in some sort of share or, or option perspective. Um, 
you look at large cap organizations, um, you know, the, the uh, an average board member at the Bank of Montreal would have a, a retainer of $500,000 or more, and their overall compensation would, would be in the neighborhood of a, a million dollars a year if you totaled between um, uh, both cash and, and, um, and uh, other components of remuneration. So there's a huge differentiation. Uh, it, the, you know, I, we could spend an entire uh, session on the different ways that uh, organizations try to attract board members. Uh, but the, uh, from a corporate perspective, you can go from almost no retainer to retainers that, uh, again, are, you know, in the neighborhood of, um, you know, what most people would, would look at as a good corporate uh, salary. Yep, I'd agree. I won't expand too much because I know we're, we're wanting to make sure we get through the next session, but I saw uh, a question pop up. Is it is it okay to ask? Certainly it is. Uh, most of them are going to have that included towards the bottom of the posting. That'll include a per diem. Uh, and as Morgan's highlighted, many of the Crown Corporations, public sector or uh, non-for-profit associations, it'll often be a per diem. It won't be a significant amount from that perspective, but it will be communicated fairly, fairly openly. Uh, in terms of being able to take that into account when assessing opportunities. I think so, we've covered most of this. Sorry, go ahead, Renee. Yeah, I, I think we've covered most of this. Uh, how did the board opportunity align with your career plan, your passions, your goal? Uh, really assessing those opportunities are going to align with your values. Um, so uh, taking that into consideration. Preparing for the board interview. I'll hand it to so uh, we'll, um, because we want to give you the opportunity to have your session at the end, uh, we won't read through each of these. You're going to have the opportunity to, um, uh, to have this package at the end. Uh, but there is a few things that, that we'd like to highlight that just to uh, extrapolate uh, a few of the, the uh, bullets that we've got here. Uh, board interviews, generally speaking, the, the first point is probably the most important one that uh, Re Renee, Joanna, and I want to highlight and re-highlight for this group. It is a job interview. You need to treat it like one. Um, and that means the preparation that's involved, just like you would in any uh, opportunity within your corporate career, you need to treat it as such. Now, there are those very special people that are invited to boards. Again, this session is probably not for those people anyway. For the rest of us, this is really about treating this as an opportunity um, that you're passionate about that you want. And if you're passionate and you want something, you don't need to go get it. And that means preparation. Board interviews, generally speaking, and this is a generalization, but um, uh, you know, if we're talking in, in those contexts, are usually shorter, both corporately and from a public sector perspective. Uh, Renee has probably seen this more than I have, but as an example, the Canadian Energy Regulator, which is a hugely important uh, entity uh, sitting here in Alberta, uh, board interviews, and we, we put that entire board together, we're a half an hour, a half an hour per person. So you, you, there's a real skill about being clear, being descriptive, and being succinct. And, and doing all those three things at the same time, they're difficult, but it is important. And that's why preparation is important. So you can get your message across and, and convey both career experience. And again, this is, this is a challenge uh, and a skill, uh, convey career experience and convey governance experience. Cause we want to hear about both the career experiences, the special skill sets that likely got you there. And the governance experience is going to, how you're going to add value. So you need to be able to tie those in and, and good interviewers should have ways to tease that out. But not everybody that is doing board interviews are necessarily good interviewers. And so you need to know your story and you need to be able to communicate that effectively. Um, the other thing that I wanted to highlight is um, the, from a corporate perspective, uh, from, sorry, from a public sector perspective, you need to understand that they're the, um, the process itself, it can be very, you know, so I talked about a half an hour and then there can be huge wait time. So you need to be patient. You need to understand as best possible that you have less control than you'd like over the interview process. Um, from a corporate perspective, you need to be prepared to have your formal 
preparatory sort of interview and do all the things that we've highlighted in terms of interview preparation and what you do for a corporate interview. But you also need to be prepared, and this is for both you and for the board, that there'll likely be additional meetings in less formal settings. So that means a meeting likely with the chair, one-on-one, -on -one, um, perhaps a board dinner, either with the full board or part of the board. And that's really to get fit on both sides. And my advice, and I think our advice, um, if my colleagues agree, is that you should be yourself, uh, not who they wanna be during those meetings. Ultimately, you're gonna have to be who you are once you join the board. And once you're on a board uh, without hurting your reputation, it's often hard to um, pull yourself off that board unless you know there's you know health issues or those sorts of things. It's a commitment, and, and it's a commitment that can last a long time. So be yourself. If they don't like who you are, or can or vice versa, you don't like who they are. It's better that you know up front. So those uh, secondary sort of meetings, they're just as important because you're going to get a sense of the context of that organization. But again, you still need to go in there pre prepared to be comfortable and be yourself, but also to ask, ask, um, answer some tough questions. Um, if you can flip over to the next slide here, Joanna, we just wanted to provide a, um, so you, you'll receive uh, this information here. These are a bunch of to-dos that basically you do within your own corporate career as well. But I just want to go over to the sample interview questions if we could. And so we've provided a number of sample interview questions and, and uh, when the group has time, you can take a read through uh, a number of these. We've provided, I don't want to call these uh, softball, but more generic sort of questions here that uh, would be part and parcel with many different board searches uh, or, or board recruitments uh, that we've either been part of or, or we've seen um, you know, both from a Crown Corporation as well as from a corporate perspective. Um, what I wanted to highlight though is beyond some of these questions that you know probably work for almost every board and get to the root of uh, your governance experience, understanding your career history, this should help you prepare in terms of how you think about yourself and how you prepare. But what we haven't put on here and I want to highlight is there are likely going to be questions that are going to be specific to the industry. So I used the example earlier of an activist investor uh, that was involved with, uh, with TriCan. So when we were doing the board search, each candidate was asked specifically about any experience with activist investors or hostile takeovers. So if you don't think about the context of what you're interviewing for, you're really going to be flat footed within that interview. Um, another question that, that we often ask is, tell us about a situation where you've had a experience disagreements around a board table. How did you handle that situation and what would you do differently? Um, Another question, based on the information you have today, can you describe the challenges and opportunities you see for our organization in the next two to three years? And where do you see our industry going? So in that sort of question, they're asking for your knowledge of the industry, your knowledge of their business, and for you to forecast or give some uh, insight into where an industry might be going. So we've provided a bunch of interview questions that uh, in some respects, ask about corporate career. In some respects, ask about uh, governance career. But pe be prepared whatever organization that you're targeting, um, that uh, you're looking at, understand the business, understand the industry. Again, read their analyst notes because any good board should be asking some probing questions. And again, so if you go in unprepared or, or thinking that they're chasing you, and you can't show or demonstrate some interest around that, it, it, um, you know, it, it's an easy way to fail. Um, Renee, anything that you want to add from that perspective? No, the only thing I'll add is, is a question that we often get and you often, uh, we can't answer during the process itself. But when a board is recruiting, you can expect that they're going to interview anywhere between three and four individuals for each board position that's available. Um, so really taking into account some of the advice and, and ensuring you're well prepared can help you set a, uh, set a step up uh, and, and uh, stand out in terms of those board interviews. Sorry, we ran a little over time there. We're too excited about this subject. <laughs> 
Uh, and it, this is an opportunity for any final questions to come through. Uh, if you do have a question, please do please do post it in the chat space or the Q and A, and we're welcome. We'll welcome to answer it. I did have one question come through a little earlier. Uh, are these treated equally, ICD or uh, C, uh, C director? I'm not sure which one that. Yeah, that's a director's college. Um, short answer is yes. Um, short, that, that's the short answer. The longer answer is uh, that I would suggest to you that um, we, have an influx of individuals after they take their ICD that call us and say that they're ready for boards. Um, that is a tool. It's an important tool. It's great education. But as Re uh, Renee and I talked about, a board journey includes spending time and investing in this over time. So if I see an individual that has never ever sat on a board, whether it's not-for-profit, uh, public sector, or, or corporate, and they get their ICD and they all of a sudden expect to be jumping on a mid-cap board, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, um, it doesn't mean a lot to me. That this, this, it, the practical experience of actually living and, and breathing and solving issues on boards in concert with good education and credentials are what make good board members, but it's hard for us to, um, uh, to delineate one without the other. Um, so, so just uh, um, to answer your question directly, yes, uh, we would look at them um, like that. But I, I do just want to add that yeah, it's in concert, in concert with some practical experience. Um, and again, you know, we don't expect that people instantly jump on, um, you know, big boards right off of the bat. That's why you should continue to look at this as a longer term sort of career goal, if that is indeed a career goal for you. We have two final questions come through. Uh, should we have a CV and board bio? Yes. Yeah, I, yeah, I think you should have both. Morgan and I might answer that differently, but I think enough for those early conversations. It's important if you've highlighted the information we've, uh, we've detailed. And if you are working with a recruiter, they may give you feedback on that on what's appropriate for that particular organization. Okay. Thank you. Um, my my I bias just questions come in. Yes, sorry. Just yeah, it's quick... lighting up right now. So let's let's get through these while we can. Um, okay. How do you approach recruiters regarding your board interest? Uh, directly, I mean, would be my my short answer. Um, the I I know we have a bad reputation of not getting back to everyone, uh, but uh, you know, I I I personally answer anybody that gets back to me. Uh, we had had a tip on slide 11 or something like that, that understand where you're at in your board journey. So if, if we're working on a publicly traded uh, board search and you've never sat on a board before and you send in your board uh, bio, you're probably not gonna be considered for that. But if you're polite and, and respectful and you wanna get on a board radar, I would think that most uh, good recruiters will spend time for you. As long as you're not rude, pushy, and you know, give us the time to get back to you. Um, I would just, uh, I would honestly just reach out and um, try to talk to someone. I'll just clarify, as a profession, we're not good at getting back to people, not voiding, right? <laughs> not right <Morgan. laughs> uh, I just okay. add to that, Joanne, I'll, I'll just add quickly that I'm always interested to know of individuals that are that are interested in being on board. I think it's important to know what, what Morgan said is that we are often representing an organization. So if we don't have a board position at that time, that's a good fit for you. Uh, I wouldn't take it as a negative that we haven't gotten back to you. We manage very large uh, CRMs, very large databases. Uh, and so it's important when you are looking out there to make it known that you're uh, you're interested in board positions. So if it's not one that we're working on currently, it may be one that we reflect on uh, with another opportunity. So getting your word out there, sharing your board CV, uh, and that you're interested, I think is valuable. Okay, a couple quick ones here. I think, will being on a small board harm your chances of getting on a mid-large board? Yeah, depending. Uh, so depends on your time commitment. So if, if and, this, and this also is impacted by where you're at in terms of your own career journey. So if you're on a small board and 
you need to know your story about why. So are you passionate about it? it does it have big upside? What's the potential? How does that fit in terms of your own time commitment? You know, if you're on a few small boards and a big one comes along um, and you're boarded out or you don't have time, then it can impact that. But if you have uh, the rationale about why beyond that's the first board I could get on, I don't believe it would impact that. I know a number of board members here um, that are friends of the firm that sit on a few large caps and then have a few personal projects or private boards that they sit on that are entrepreneurial or in the tech sector or our venture that that are part of their portfolio of, of board work. So um, it, it depends on the context somewhat, but I, I wouldn't suggest that that's an eliminator from those opportunities just at, at a very baseline sort of answer. Okay, perfect. Thank you. One last question and we'll conclude. Are you seeing more board searches that require ICD or equivalent training? I have very few on the corporate side that make it mandatory. Uh, most see it as a value add, but not as an eliminator of individuals if they don't have it. Uh, but, you know, if they're at a tie, that would certainly impact, uh, you know, one to the other but I have very few that actually make it mandatory for the candidates to uh, be considered. Yeah, I'd, I'd add on that that we've got a number of boards that are actually so actively supporting their board members to achieve their ICD while they're on the board. Um, so we're seeing that more and more, but I don't think it's a differentiator unless all things are equal. Okay, thank you both, great. So we did have a breakout room discussion slated for the end of the meeting, but since we had a lot of questions coming through, I think we will proceed without, but um, still make sure that this is, uh, this is a moment that everyone takes to really reflect on today's session and the learnings. Uh, certainly the, the information shared is meant to ignite your, uh, your board journey. Uh, we encourage you all to take time to consider your networks, your motivations, and how you articulate your skill sets, as these are really the building blocks towards being more visible uh, and, and accessing more board opportunities. Of course, uh, identifying organizations that might be a match. You are then increasing your opportunity of building out your network uh, when, you're, when you're targeting that approach and really launching that strategic, uh, strategic approach. Now, as we close our session, uh, I'd really like to thank our masterclass instructors today, Morgan Campbell and Renee Young. Thank you for sharing your insights uh, in this step of the board journey. I do want to remind everybody of the next upcoming events in the, in the masterclass series are taking place in October, in September and October. These continue our conversation. They focus on board, board service and how and when to move on from a board. We'll bring in experts to speak in on both sessions and we'll share the details very soon. So look out for that in your IWF Toronto chapter uh, eblast. And if you, not ha if you have not yet signed up for these, then please remember to do so. Thank you all for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you in September. Take care everyone. Thank you.